from Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 1 to 14, is that right? That's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfilment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, in Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Right, thank you, Joe. <laughs> Let's just have a short word of prayer. Father God, we do indeed thank you for your word, and as we turn to look at it now, I just pray that you would help us to understand, help us to be open, help us to be listening to what you would have to say to us this morning. And Lord, I pray for myself, please speak through me and give me the words um, as I explain this, this passage uh, this morning, Lord, and deliver the message that you've laid upon my heart. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, this morning we're going to carry on with the series that we started a few weeks ago, looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And last time, you remember, we looked at the first three verses, where we considered the reasons to rejoice that are right there at the very beginning. We looked at Paul's greeting, and then we looked at how he praised God for his spiritual blessings. Well, we're going to continue in that vein this morning as we look at the next few verses in that chapter and we'll think about the greatest spiritual blessing of all, our salvation. So I've called this morning's sermon uh, the mystery of salvation. Because there's a word that we'll consider in a few weeks which relates to some parts of the letter to the Ephesians and that is that word mystery. And there is some mystery about how exactly our salvation works. Who does what? And how much depends on us? Well, when we repent of our sin, we are responding in faith to the offer of forgiveness. But is it all just something that we choose to do ourselves? No, of course not. God obviously plays a big part in salvation, but how much of a part does God play in our salvation? Actually, all of it. All of it. In Jonah 2 verse 9, Jonah says, Salvation is of the Lord. And that statement, as we'll see this morning, is borne out by what Paul writes here in the following verses. So to start off, we've got some SCs this morning. And the first one, for starters, he talks about God's sovereign choice. In verse 4, For he, as God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's actually quite timely that this morning we've had the, um, the forms for election of committee members or nominations for the election of committee members. And we've recently had local elections and the election, of course, for the London Mayor. And in those elections, people vote for the candidate that they think is best suited for the job. They choose the person that they think would be the most suited. I think Count Binface did better than expected in London, but obviously not quite well enough to win, did he? But not that everyone's always happy about the results of an election. And time will tell whether the elected person actually lives up to the role. Yeah. We have the same situation when you apply for a job. The best candidate is chosen based on their suitability for the job, or their qualifications, or their skills. Aaron has now started applying for jobs in the summer, once he finishes his exams. And he's applied for two or three so far, but no joy. 
It takes me back to when I was 17 and I was writing job application letters around and got all the thank you but no thank you but we'll keep your details on file kind of letters. Mm. Well, I've also told this story before, but I will remember being um, doing games at school, doing sports, and two people would be chosen to pick their teams, and it's always been that we get left to last. I wasn't the sporty one, I wasn't competitive enough, I wasn't good enough. Nobody ever wanted to pick Steve for their team. And if we don't get chosen, it can damage our self-confidence, it can make us feel unwanted. But if we do get chosen, then somebody has seen something in us that warrants them selecting us, can make us feel special, wanted. And we feel grateful to the person who's picked us. We want to show that we appreciate their trust being put in us and we'll try to be the best that we can. So what does it mean when we're told that God chose us? Well, the word chosen here comes from the Greek word from which we also get the English word election. And if we're Christians, if we are true believers, we are because God chose us, because we are elect. We've been chosen by God himself. Chosen for what? Chosen for salvation. Chosen to be spared the punishment that we deserve for our sins. But unlike those examples that I've just been through, going for a job, being elected um, as a, a mayor or a councillor, or even being picked for a sports team, we are not chosen because of anything special about us. God doesn't choose us because of some quality that we've got that makes us deserve to be chosen. See, none of us is good enough by God's standards. God takes us as we are. It's all down to his grace. And it's his sovereign choice. In John 15, verse 16, we read the words of the Lord Jesus where he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. And we're chosen in him. That little phrase I mentioned last time, in him, in Christ, that phrase that occurs several times through the letter, we're all one in him, because God has chosen us in him. So who is God's sovereign choice? If we are saved, if we are Christians, we are. We, God has chosen us. But when? When did God make that choice? Well, let's look again at what the verse says. He chose us in him before the creation of of the world. Now think about that for a moment. God has his salvation plan before there was ever a sinner to save, or even before a sin had been committed. And God chose us at that point as the people all these centuries later that would believe in him. What God determined was going to happen in eternity past is being carried out perfectly in time. So if we are saved, if we are born again believers in the Lord Jesus, God knew about it and he chose us way back before he even made the world, back before he even put a star in place. He chose us. And you think of all the people who have lived throughout all the centuries and yet God knew every single one who would put their trust in him as Lord and Saviour. He'd chosen us for salvation way, way back. Charles Spurgeon said this, I'm so glad that God chose me before the foundation of the world, because he would never have chosen me after I was born. It's a thought, isn't it? God chose us before the creation of the world. Why? Why did he choose us? Well, we were chosen, as we're told here, to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, that's a tall order, isn't it? If I was chosen for a job as an accountant, and I was chosen to never make a mistake in a set of accounts, well, I'd have fallen down on that many times over the years. So if God has chosen us to be holy, blameless, sinless, can we live up to that? Well, again, it's not down to us. You see, our sin is offensive to God, and we are all of us unworthy sinners. And yet God in his love offers us forgiveness through the Lord Jesus who has paid for our sin. And we're covered with a robe of righteousness. We can stand acceptable in the sight of God. First in Galatians, Galatians 3 verse 26 says, In Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We've been clothed in Christ. And in Isaiah 61 it says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. That, that arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest. 
and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. You see, God cannot bear to look on sin, and yet he can look on us as accepted, forgiven children. Why? Because our sin has been covered. That's how we can be holy and blameless in his sight. But another why before we move on, and this is always a tricky one, why does God choose some and not others? Shouldn't he save everybody? Well, actually, why should he? None of us deserves to be saved. We are all sinners. And if we are saved, if we are Christians, it's not because it's our right, it's not because it's our entitlement to be saved, but it's an act of God's grace. Saving us from the punishment that we deserve. So we might ask ourselves, well, okay, I'm a Christian, why did God save me, but not Frank Long's down the road? <laughs> well, the answer is we don't know who he has and he hasn't chosen. None of us know what work the Lord is doing in the hearts of people. Only he knows what goes on in people's hearts. And our job, when we know that we've been saved, when we know that we are Christians, our job is to share the good news of the gospel with those around us, to make sure people know the way of salvation, to make sure people know that Jesus died for our sins, and that in him, there, and him alone, there is the hope for forgiveness. And when we share the good news, we pray for people, pray for those around us, pray that they may come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus. You see, we've got a God who does not desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. We don't know the work that he is doing in the hearts of those that he brings into our lives or he brings us into contact with. But all we need to do is trust him. Trust his ways. Don't try and understand it all and unpack it all in our minds. Just trust him in faith. Because one day in glory, we will understand. So, if indeed it is God's sovereign choice, who will be saved, and it is. What part do we play in that? Because we're not just robots. And we could get quite deep here considering the doctrines of predestination and election and what role we play in choosing to follow Christ if God has already chosen those who will be saved. It's a difficult area. And theologians have disagreed with this over the centuries, so we won't dig too deep. We can't deny that we have a responsibility to respond to the offer of God's grace. We do but it's an offer that we cannot refuse. You see, if you were starving and you were dying because you weren't getting any food and someone came and offered you the food that would give you life and health, make you better, you wouldn't turn it away, would you? Well, likewise, when we receive the offer of God's grace and forgiveness and we realise, truly realise, that without him we are lost, how could we refuse? God chooses us and by his Holy Spirit he draws us to himself. That's the work in our lives. Spurgeon said that our responsibility and God's sovereignty in the matter of salvation are like two almost parallel lines, and our human minds can't understand how they could ever meet. But they do meet, and they meet at the throne of grace, and that's all we need to know. God's sovereign choice. And as a result of God's sovereign choice, there are spiritual consequences. What are the spiritual consequences for us if indeed God has chosen us? Well, first of all, we are changed. When we come to faith in the Lord Jesus, a change occurs. We were living without the hope of forgiveness, but now we have hope. We are forgiven. We belong to God. We were in the dark, now we're in the light. We are new creations. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10 reminds us, it, uh, it says here, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. We are changed. As we sang a few moments ago, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. We're not the same. And as Paul says here, we were chosen to be holy and blameless. As I said, we're never going to be perfect while we're down here on the earth. We won't be perfect until we get up there to glory. Yeah. And we'll stand before God in our white robes. But while we are here in this life, the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, changing us, helping us to be more like the people that we should be. Little by little, yeah. he's changing us and as I said last time, being a saint 
And we're all saints, we're believers. Being a saint means that we are being sanctified, being made holy. And as that happens, we shall bear fruit for his glory. We are changed. And then it's verse 5. We are children. Verse 5 says, In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Now, in these days when Paul was writing this letter, the world, of course, was under Roman law. And family was all important to the Jew, as we know. But it was also very important to the Romans. And there was a law for the family called Patria Potestas, or the Father's Power. And this law gave the father absolute power over what happened in his family. And every, particularly over every aspect of his children's lives. Where they worked, he could sell them if necessary. If he wanted to sell his children into slavery, he was at liberty to do so. Even if they'd done wrong, he could pronounce the death penalty on his own children. And regardless of the child's age, while their father was alive, the father held all power over personal and property rights. So when it came to adoption, that was a serious matter. When a child was adopted, three legal steps were taken. Firstly, the adopted son would be adopted permanently. Couldn't be adopted today and then unadopted the next day, no. He became a son of the father and would be so forever, eternally secure as a son in that household. He immediately lost all the rights of a legitimate son. Sorry, he immediately had all the rights of a legitimate son in the new family. And he completely lost all the rights in his old family. He was looked upon as a new person, so all the old debts and obligations and things that tied into his previous life, to his previous family, were cancelled and abolished as if they'd never existed. And there's a parallel there, isn't there? There is a parallel because we're changed, we are new people, and when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, we are given a new start. But here, we're reminded that we are instantly adopted into God's family. We become his children. We're adopted permanently. And God is our Heavenly Father, and we belong to him forever. We become our heirs. As we're reminded in Romans 8, if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And everything that's in our past is wiped away, wiped clean. And of course, being heirs of Christ, we have that glorious inheritance to look forward to. Eternal life in heaven. So our adoption as God's children and the changes in our lives take place when we become Christians. But when exactly does that happen? Well, verse 13 says, You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal. See, this is where it then kind of starts for us, when we are convicted and convinced. When you heard the word of truth and believed. It's that point where we hear the gospel, we come under the sound of the gospel. And something within us says, yes. We recognise that we are lost sinners. We recognise that we have fallen short. We have done wrong in the eyes of God. We are unworthy. From the smallest bad thought or attitude, right up to the worst thing that we've ever done, sin is sin in God's eyes, and we're all guilty of it. And we realise this, and we realise that because of that we should be going to hell for our sin. That's when we feel convicted, and it's the Holy Spirit working in us that brings about that conviction. But then we realise that there is hope. There is hope in the Lord Jesus because he died on the cross to pay for our sin, to take the punishment in our place. And all we need to do is to believe in him, turn to him in repentance, say sorry from our hearts and truly mean it, have a desire to live a new life, let him work in our lives, make him Lord of our lives, and he will save us. See, we are convinced at that point that this is the hope that we have, the only hope. Just as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is our only hope. And God gives us the faith that we need to take that step of turning to him. So when the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of the lost sinner and draws them to Jesus. When that sinner responds by looking to Jesus by faith, the result is salvation. So if we want sure that we're going to heaven and that we've been forgiven, we simply need to believe and respond to the gospel. And God gives us the faith to do that. 
Good news that Jesus has taken the punishment in our place. Through him, we can be forgiven. And then, as I said, let him be the Lord of our lives. Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him shall never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? You see, there's that reminder of our responsibility again. Faith comes through hearing. People need to hear that word of truth to be convinced of their sin, to be convinced of the hope and the need to respond. And we have that message to share with those around us, the good news of the gospel. So we are changed, we are children, we are convicted and convinced. But there's one more. The hope that we have is certain. We have a certain hope. See, when, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Verses 13 and 14. We are sealed. Now when Paul says we are sealed, he's referring to the old practice of sealing letters or other official documents with a wax seal. You put a blob of wax on there and a signet ring would be pressed into the wax and the document was sealed. It carried the authority of the person who owned the seal. When a king placed his seal on a document, it showed that the document was final, it was secure, couldn't be changed. It showed authenticity. The seal proved that it was for real. And the seal could also show ownership, seeing a deed that showed that something truly belonged to someone. If we're believers, we have been sealed. We have the Holy Spirit in us, working in our lives. And as he refers to the Holy Spirit as a deposit, he then says that our inheritance is guaranteed. Because not only are we sealed, we are secured. When we are his, we are his forever. John chapter 6, verses 43 to 44. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. See, there's God working in salvation. And I will raise them up at the last day. Spiritual consequences. But finally, as we prepare to come to our time around the Lord's table, we should remember salvation's cost. Salvation's cost. Because nothing in life is free. But there is a free offer of salvation to be found in the gospel. Why is it a free offer? Because Jesus paid the price. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. What is redemption? Well, redemption is the buying back of something that was lost. And it's that which God has done. And we become his. We were lost, but now we belong to him. And the best illustration of redemption, I think, is this lovely little story which I've shared before. Um, a little boy had built a lovely model sailing boat. He spent many days and weeks building this boat, carving it, putting the sails on, varnishing it. When it was finally completed, he decided he would test it out on the water, close to where he lived. He went down to the water, he put the boat on there, and it was sailing along quite nicely. And then a gust of wind caught it, and it started to move away from him. And he got in the water, he started chasing after this boat, but he couldn't catch it. He went to the deeper water where he didn't dare go, and soon it disappeared off down the stream. He got home in tears. And his mum said, what's wrong? Didn't your boat work? He said, yes, but it worked too well. It sailed away. He'd lost the thing that he'd made. A few days later, he was walking downtown, and walked past a second-hand shop. And there in the window, he saw his boat. Couldn't believe his eyes, so he went into the shop, picked up the boat, went to leave, and the shopkeeper said, hang on a minute. You can't walk out with that, you've got to pay for it. He said, but it's my boat. I made it. He said, sorry, this is a second-hand shop. I bought that in good faith. If you want it, you've got to buy it back. So the little boy went home, did lots of jobs to earn enough money to go back to the shop 
And finally he was able to buy back his boat. Yeah. And as he walked out of the shop, he hugged the boat close to him and he said, your boat, my boat, you're twice my boat. You're my boat firstly because I made you and secondly because I bought you. That's redemption. We are God's because he made us. He made everyone. He's the creator. But secondly, we are his because he bought us. Bought with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. You see, we're told that without the, remission, the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sins. And the blood of Jesus had to be shed on that cross at Calvary. He had to be that once and for all sacrifice that would pay for the sin of mankind. It's a cost that we can't even begin to imagine. But as Jesus paid the price, forgiveness and salvation and a restored relationship with God and eternity in heaven are offered freely to us. The price has been paid. So, as I draw these thoughts to a close, do we know this morning for certain that we are saved? Do we know that our sins have been forgiven? If you do, rejoice in the fact that God chose you before the creation of the world and he's at work in your life. If you don't know it for yourself though, trust him today. Turn to him in faith. Seek his forgiveness for your sins. It's the greatest thing that you can ever do. And the reward for repentance and faith in Jesus starts in this life and extends on into eternity when we have that glorious future promised for us in heaven. A place where things will be better than we can ever imagine. And it's all possible because of what the Lord Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary. We'll gather together around the table in a moment and reflect on that. But first, let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, we do indeed thank you that in all things you are sovereign. Our very salvation hinged on the fact that way back before anything was ever made, before the creation of the world, you chose us in Christ for salvation. Lord, we thank you for the great love that you have for us. The love that brought the Lord Jesus down to this earth to lay down his life on the cross, to pay that price for sin. And because the price has been paid, there's no price for us to pay. We just I have to turn to you in repentance and accept the offer of forgiveness that is offered to us. Lord, thank you that you give us the faith to be able to do that. And thank you that you're then at work in our lives, for the rest of our lives, helping us to be more like the people that you want us to be. Thank you, Father, for your great love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.